Good morning or good evening, FAOs and current future leaders of the Rock US Alliance. My name is Wei Chow, president of the FAO Association Korea chapter. And I will be your moderator today. For today's forum, I'll begin with some questions from the board. Then at about the halfway point, we'll transition to open discussion. Uh, please feel free to use the chat box or the raise hand function to ask a question. Uh, as this is part of our coffee and chat series, free flow discussion is encouraged. Also, this discussion is for public release. So please remember to keep statements at an unclassified level. Our guest speaker for today served 30 years in the US Army, retiring as a Colonel in Special Forces, teaching national security strategy at the National War College. He has served in various positions around the world, including over 20 years in the Indo-Pacific. Following his retirement, he was Associate Director for the Security Studies Program at Georgetown University until 2017. He is currently a fellow at the Institute of Korean American Studies and senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, who have a great podcast, by the way. He is on the board of directors uh, for the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, International Council of Korean Studies, the Council of U.S. Korean Security Studies, the Special Operations Research Association, Small Wars Journal, and the OSS Society. Please give a warm welcome to David Maxwell. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. And, um, you know, just let me uh, start off by saying, uh, um, yeah, as I said, I've, I've had a lot of years in Asia, but uh, uh, I've often been uh, called a fail. And, uh, and you know, I'm not a fail. And, uh, but I think it's one of the biggest compliments that I, I ever receive when somebody mistakes me for a fail. And uh, I always have, uh, it's one, one of my regrets uh, for my career that I was never able to be a fail. Uh, because I really, uh, I really respect all the work that you do and uh, and the contributions that you make, uh, which I think are very unique and unsung, and um, uh, you know, and just not well understood by people outside uh, outside the community. But I've been blessed, you know, to have a real regional focus, which of course is not by design <laughs> at all. Uh, you know, you all of you know how the our personnel system works, the personnel management system, and uh, I've just been you know, lucky uh, in some ways, uh, uh, or, you know, other people might say I'm unlucky, but uh, I've been able to, you know, have five tours in Korea. Um, and, uh, and that's really been, uh, been a great experience and something I've really, uh, really enjoyed. Um, and I continue to focus on, on Korea, of course, and what I do. Um, at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, you know, we are a nonpartisan uh, think tank and we're focused purely on uh, national security and, and, and foreign policy. Um, and our job is really to, uh, to advance US national security and foreign policy, explaining it to the public um, and supporting uh, the US government, OSD, state, uh, the Hill, uh, the National Intelligence uh, Office. You know, I work a lot with uh, Sid Seiler um, and um, you know, the National Intelligence Council. And, and so, uh, you know, our job is, I mean, it's really great to be able to just uh, write, research, participate in events like this, uh, and, uh, and engage on, on the strategic issues that we're all concerned about. Uh, so, you know, when you think about retirement, uh, there are some, some good jobs out there uh, that, uh, that you'll, you'll be able to put your, your skills to, uh, to great use. Um, the, the last thing I'll just say before we, uh, you know, I'll talk a little substance there is I, I was always able to use my uh, professional military education to focus on Korea. Um, when I was at SAMS in the 90s, I, uh, I wrote my second monograph on the catastrophic collapse in North Korea. And of course that was 95, 96 when uh, the arduous march was taking place. And then uh, they sent me back to Korea and, and I worked in CFC staff and got to, uh, got to work on uh, co-authoring the, uh, the first con plan 5029 with Bob Collins and uh, for General Talele. Uh, and it was a great experience to do that. Later, when I was a student at the National War College, I did a, a research fellowship for a year while I was uh, uh, while I was a student, and I was able to focus on Korea and wrote a thesis on a long-term strategy for the Korean Peninsula beyond uh, beyond the nuclear uh, threat. And so, uh, so I've spent a lot of time looking at the problems and and looking at beyond beyond the problems. Um, let me just say about Korea. In the Korean Peninsula is, um, you know, I, I, talking to you, it's, it's like preaching to the choir, but what I always try to tell people 
you know, about the importance of the Korean Peninsula is that it really, uh, it is really a geostrategic location. And, and North Korea, the threat, of course, is connected really to all of our national security problems. Uh, the two revisionist powers, China and Russia, uh, as well as the rogue powers, uh, you know, Iran and North Korea, and North Korea's proliferation activities, uh, you know, the Middle East and, and Africa, uh, you know, proliferating weapons to conflict zones. Uh, you know, North Korea is really at the nexus of all of our security problems. Uh, and then, of course, the importance of the peninsula is whether there's a war, God forbid, hope there's not, uh, or regime collapse, which will still likely lead to some form of conflict, uh, it, it's going to have global effects. You know, with the second and third largest economy in the world, two nuclear powers, North Korea is a rogue nuclear state, you know, the amount of military force in the region here, it is going to have global effects. So what I tell people is what happens on the Korean Peninsula, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, is going to have effects on America. And it is in the U.S. interest really to prevent war. And that's really got to be our job one. And, and we, you know, all of you, we, we, uh, we hear the, the rhetoric, you know, ready to fight tonight, you know, deter war, deterrence. Uh, but it really does mean a lot. Unfortunately, you know, we are, we are victims of our success, you know, that we've effectively deterred war since 1953. And I think deterring war is the only thing we can deter. We can't deter provocations. We can't deter actions by, by North Korea, uh, by Kim Jong-un, but we have to deter war. And, uh, and of course, you know, war can happen. We can have the best deterrence in the world as Sir Lawrence Friedman, uh, the great strategist from the UK says, you know, deterrence works until it doesn't. Uh, and I think that's true. Um, and no one can prevent miscalculation. Uh, you know, and of course, we don't know what Kim Jong-un uh, talks about, you know, what he intends to do, uh, for sure. You know, that said, I, I you know, in my questions, uh, answers to your questions tonight, I'll make some pretty declarative statements. Um, I, you know, I've internalized a lot of things, and I, I will speak as if I'm speaking facts. Uh, but as all of you know, there are no experts on North Korea. Uh, it is a hard target. And, you know, I consider myself a student of the problem. Uh, but, you know, when I'm, when I'm stating what I believe, it's really based on, you know, my study, my experience, my internalization of the problem. And so I will, I will make some pretty declarative sentences. Uh, that said, anything I say can and should be challenged. Uh, because we just don't have have all the answers. So uh, if it seems like I'm saying something as as definite fact, uh, please uh, please feel free to challenge me. I'm happy to do that. So uh, with that, I'm happy to to uh, I'm happy to be here. Happy to see all of you and uh, and you know respect all the work that you're doing. So I'm I'm glad to be able to uh, to dialogue with you and engage. Well, thank you very much for that. And uh, and. Thank you for your statement about uh, about encouraging discussion. Um, this uh, just like to remind everyone again that since this is our coffee and chat series, uh, please feel free uh, to interject uh, if there's anything you'd like to add to the discussion at any point in time. I would like to start with uh, with the first question. It's a multi part one uh, that I'm sure is on the forefront of everyone's minds. Russia has launched a full scale military invasion of Ukraine drawing some stark comparisons to World War II. Um, understanding the U.S. has no treaty obligations to Ukraine, how do you think this will impact American partners and allies, not only in Europe, but around the world? And then what would your advice be to individuals that are actively working in these alliances every day? And the last part of this question is, even though if you follow, if you look at the media, um, the media consistently talks about the isolation of Russia to this activity. One nation that has conspicuously been um, supportive of the Russian invasion has been North Korea. Do you think this invasion could embolden uh, North Korea in any way? And how are we gonna have a discussion? I've got, that's gonna take me the next couple hours to answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but those are great questions. Uh, first, I, I think, you know, it's really, I hope that we don't compare this situation in Ukraine to World War II, but I will say, I'm really thinking that we are at an inflection point uh, with, uh, with what is happening. I mean, it's really, uh, this is, I think, coming down to uh, authoritarianism versus the free world. 
Uh, and I, I really think it, you know, there is an ideological fight, which I think is more along the lines of the Cold War than World War II. Uh, and, and I think we've, we've really got, uh, you know, Russia acting out. And of course, China sitting in the wings as an authoritarian country as well, um, which I think is important to, to understand. And in fact, you know, when I, when I think about China, uh, which I think is, is a bigger problem than Russia in the long, uh, in the long run, uh, but obviously they're related and, and uh, mutually supporting. You know, I think about China and, and my, my basic thesis about China is that it seeks to export its authoritarian political system around the world uh, in order to dominate regions and co-opt or coerce international organizations and create economic conditions favorable to China alone uh, and displace democratic institutions. I think Russia uh, also is along those lines as well. And I think that's... Um, uh, you know, I think there's some parallels, although I think, you know, Russia is not as strong as, as China is and, uh, um, you know, and it's certainly acting out. So I think we could be at a real inflection point. And I think what, what is resulting, at least in the initial days here with uh, the Ukraine situation is, is that the free world does seem to be uh, mobilizing and, and, you know, getting its act together. Um, you know, of course, a lot of people, you know, would just like us to intervene uh, militarily, I think. But, you know, if we can provide support to Ukraine, if the Ukrainians can defeat Russia, uh, and of course, uh, Zelensky is turning out to be a great role model, uh, you know, and, and, and you guys who work in strategic communications, uh, you would love to have a leader like that, I think, uh, to, uh, to uh, use, you know, use his words and his example. Uh, but I, I think, uh, you know, this could really be positive in the long run. The, the other thing that it's, it's really doing, um, it, it's really emphasizing the basic national security policy of, of the Biden administration, the importance of alliances. You know, and that goes to the part of your question. You know, I really think that, uh, that you know, our national security depends on strong alliances and, and we, can't, we can't go it alone. Uh, we can't go it alone anywhere in the world, but you know, we, uh, we are better uh, and stronger uh, you know, when we have strong alliances, you know, we're stronger as a nation. And, and I think that, uh, I think that, you know, what comes out of this could be a strengthening of the alliances. It certainly looks like NATO is, is becoming more unified uh, than it has been in many years with Germany now going to spend 2% of its GDP and, uh, you know, and emergency spending on its, um, uh, you know, on its defense uh, budget. Uh, immediately. I mean, it, those are some pretty significant changes there. So uh, now, of course, what's happening in Ukraine is, uh, you know, it's terrible. Uh, people are suffering. Um, and I think it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And I worry about, uh, uh, you know, we, we think about Kim Jong-un and, and wonder about his mindset. Uh, you know, I think uh, Putin, we have to worry about his. And, um, uh, and it is a uh, you know, and, and is he a rational actor? And is he, you know, is he going to go off? I, I will share with you something I heard from a diplomat today who queried me, uh, asking if I had heard anything about this. You know, we're, we're all hearing about his mental health state. Um, but he asked me if I had seen any reports uh, that, uh, that Putin actually has terminal cancer, and uh, which I have not seen any of that. Uh, but he was telling me that he's talked to some people and, and some people explain that's why he's gone about this. You know, this is his last hurrah, uh, which, you know, is an interesting thesis. Uh, uh, but, uh, um, you know, I haven't seen any evidence of that. Uh, but it, it does seem like, and I, I fear that uh, he's going to double down. Now, we've also seen the Russian military perform pretty poorly uh, so far, what they're based on the reports. Um, and... Uh, and, and so, I mean, it really seems like they have a lot of problems, not effectively using drones. Uh, you know, their logistics is, is terrible. Um, you know, they're getting, they're, they're getting uh, beat up pretty good, you know, moving on roads, their armored columns. And, uh, you know, so another, another uh, out of the box thought I had as well, you know, what if, what if this is part of uh, deception? You know, what if they're showing us an incompetent army until they get to the point where, uh, where they're going to use their their best forces to uh, to achieve certain effects, um, you know that's that's just speculation on my you know a, a query on my part, uh, but it goes to the point for all of you 
uh, that, uh, you know, as FAOs is that all of you have to be able to analyze and, and, and assess the military forces of, uh, of our allies and our adversaries uh, and be able to make judgments and form judgments. Um, and so, you know, we've got to think through what's happening. And, I, and I, I'm sure that your counterparts in Korea, uh, you know, it's been my experience uh, that, uh, you know, they'll be, they'll be asking us for insights uh, and, uh, you know, and how we view things because, you know, our counterparts get asked by their bosses and uh, and so uh, it's it's an opportunity you know to share ideas and uh, and to to learn from uh, uh, to learn from that. Um, I you know the other thing I worry about Ukraine is is what it does have effects on North Korea and I can talk more in detail about you know denuclearization and, and things like that. But um, but I think that um, you know the last thing I'll say about Ukraine. Well, it won't be the last thing. I'm sure we have more questions. But uh, I think we've got to press. Uh, with with support, you know, diplomatic, economic, uh, you know, and military support, um, you know, I think we can look back. There'll be a lot of, uh, you know, shoulda, coulda, wouldas, you know, if we had only armed them earlier, you know, if we had uh, had had provided training, and if we had foreseen what was uh, what was happening, and uh, and what, and and you know, and I, I will bet you, um, you know, a good FAO friend of mine, John Chicky, uh, you know, Russian FAO. Uh, and uh, Peter Zwack, you know, who, uh, who commanded the uh, 524th MI Battalion in Korea there, by the way. But, uh, you know, they, you know, I knew that, you know, from listening to them over the years, you know, they, they saw this coming. You know, I think the FAO community, you know, could, could assess this. You know, the question is, you know, who's listening? And, uh, and that's the frustration that all of you have, uh, you know, writing reports and, and giving assessments and, uh, you know, sharing information, uh, and then people don't act on it, which, of course, is the political challenge that, that we all have. I mean, uh, everything is political and uh, our political leaders are gonna make decisions, but there will be lessons to learn. And, uh, and I think one of them, uh, one of the lessons is that uh, we, you know, our allies, yes, but our friends and partners also that are like-minded, uh, you know, where we can and where they face threats, we should try to help them. And, and the key point is um, if we can help them do it themselves. Uh, that's that's really key. You know, in special forces, our motto is "De oppresso liber" to free the oppressed. But I really like to, to describe it as to help the oppressed free themselves. And and that's really what um, you know, kind of what we're doing in, in Ukraine is we're helping them to defend themselves. And of course, they're going to have to free their occupied areas uh, eventually. But uh, they seem ready, willing, and able to do it themselves uh, as much as. You know, we have many, many in uniform who would like to march to the sound of the guns and, and go do something. I mean, I, I would love to see a thunder run from Poland and, and Romania toward Kiev. And uh, I think we would just, you know, I think the, the Russians would just drop their weapons and, and crawl back to uh, Russia if we did that. But uh, that same thunder run we saw in Baghdad in 2003, you know, if we did uh, had two axes of, of that, we'd, uh, we would scare everybody. Uh, but, you know, I don't think it's appropriate for us to do that. I think it's more appropriate for us to, uh, to do everything we can to enable the Ukrainian forces. And if we do that, you know, and they're successful, I think that's gonna change the way that we conduct security assistance uh, in the future and, um, and, and really, uh, um, you know, change the way that we, we think strategically about uh, our friends, partners, and allies, how to enable them, you know, interact and, uh, and develop uh, capabilities. So I'll stop there. Part of that, um, your your response also reminded me of a recent anecdote that I had with uh, with an associate of mine, in which uh, he criticized um, the the inability for many individuals in the military to speak truth to power, to try to go against um, political policy when they if if they if they didn't know if they knew that it wasn't right. Um, and he sort of joked offhandedly that um, it's not like walking through a minefield in Afghanistan or fighting terrorists. And uh, my response was, you know, for, for some officers, uh, for some folks in the military, um, the speaking against uh, your political policy could be even more fearful, could be even more uh, fear-inducing than, uh, than walking through a minefield. Um, 
But uh, before going to the next question, General Chen, did you did you want to make a comment? Yeah, it's so true. I mean, you know, I don't I don't know if you can. Uh, when you're at my age, you, you not only understand here, but you understand here. And it's so true. It's so difficult. That's why I feel that we really need moral courage. So the first question that everyone must ask is, is this the right thing to do? Rather than, is this good for me or not? Because if it's the second question you're going to ask first, you're always going to keep your mouth shut. Yeah, I just think, though, you know, we, we have to be careful. I mean, falling on your sword is, is good. You know, I mean, it, um, you know, very few officers uh, in the U.S. military, you know, fell on their sword. You know, one, I only one I knew about prior to Iraq, that was Lieutenant General uh, Newbold, uh, who resigned for, as the J3 of the Joint Chiefs before the attack on Iraq. And he did it very privately and, and didn't make a, a big deal. But I would say that you know, people at, at our level, you know, colonels and, and lieutenant colonels and, and majors, you know, we write reports, we provide assessments, we provide good advice. Um, and, and we have to be careful. I mean, sometimes, yeah, you're going to fall on your sword. But sometimes we, we have to understand that the political process, you know, far outweighs all of us collectively. And, uh, and, you know, it's just something that we can't do. And, and, and so, you know, we got to keep fighting the fight, speaking truth to power, but realizing, you know, that it's not always going to be acted on or acted on in the way that we recommend. Uh, and, you know, and there's two ways to look at that. There are people that are higher up that have more information, more knowledge and experience than we do. Okay, that's one, one way. Uh, or there are political considerations that they, they outweigh more than, uh, you know, the practical advice and recommendations that we're making. So, um, you know, I, believe, I agree with General Chun, you know, you do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. That's the that's the prime directive, as uh, Emmanuel Kant told us. Uh, but uh, you know, and, and you don't think about your career, but you also think not think about your career, but thinking about how you can continue to serve and be effective. Uh, so you got to balance those uh, because you know every time if if we quit or resigned every time uh, our advice wasn't taken, we'd uh, we wouldn't get very far. You know, so so we got it. We got to balance that. But speak truth to power. Uh, give your best assessment, uh, but uh, realize we can't we can't change the world individually. Roger that. Yeah. Yeah. I I just want to add just one more thing. I know this is a little bit off the uh, off the uh, issues of world politics, but since we're having coffee, I used to think of myself having one silver bullet. With this one silver bullet, I could either kill the werewolf or a squirrel or a rabbit. So I, you know, being a Korean officer, uh, especially a general officer, it multiplies what we're talking about a hundred times because of the culture and all that. So, you know, you have to choose your target very wisely. Secondly, if you do speak out, be as polite as possible. <laughs> and try not to make it personal. And I think, you know, in most cases, we have fair bosses who listen us listen to us if we're polite. So, you know, don't hurt their ego, but present your case in a professional manner is what I would give to the young people in this audience. Roger. And, and one, one last point of that is, you know, you, you got to be able to have criticism, but you also have to, to provide positive assessments as well. And I was... I was having a debate with uh, uh, some think tankers and who were very partisan. And today in, in the bulwark, uh, um, Crystal's, uh, Bill Crystal's uh, uh, website there, which is conservative, but nonpartisan. And, and it's sort of anti-Trump in, uh, but it, it, today they said, you know, there's a lot of chaos in Iraq or in, in Ukraine. Uh, and, but in the end, Biden is doing a pretty good job. And I said, you know, this is really good. You know, the, the loyal opposition, you know, you can criticize dissent, but you also have to recognize the positive as well. And I think that you are more credible when you can, can recognize the positive and, and say, you know, this good, A, B, and C is good, but, you know, D, C, and F are a problem and we need to fix that. 
You know, whereas today in today's environment, we just focus on the negative. And, and, we, and I think that if you don't focus on the positive and what your opponents, what your opposition is doing, you know, not, not the Russians, not the enemy, but, you know, your, your political opponents, uh, you know, if you don't focus on, on what they're doing well and don't recognize that and respect that, I think your negative criticism uh, becomes less value, valued and, uh, um, you know, and, and less legitimate. And so I just, just offer that. You got to have the good with the bad. Not just all good or all bad, and uh, and especially from a partisan perspective, which fortunately everybody on this on this uh, call is not partisan. So, <laughs> but uh, just keep that in mind. And Roger that. Uh, speaking of the political process, uh, one one more question before we open to discussion. Although Ukraine has captured the attention of the world, foremost on many Koreans' minds is the election of the next South Korean president taking place next week. Um, scandals and political attacks aside, there have been some pretty interesting divergences between the two main candidates in several uh, high visibility security issues. Uh, end of war declaration, engagement with North Korea, and of course, bad. Uh, how would you suggest defense policymakers prepare for either a Lee or Yoon administration? And do you foresee any potential areas of friction in either a Lee or Yoon win? Well, to your last, there'll be friction no matter what. I mean, it's the nature of the alliance. You know, there are, there are always going to be differences in the alliance. So I don't think there, I don't think either, whichever candidate wins, uh, you know, it will not be without friction. Um, I think that uh, both Yoon and, and Lee have given us uh, um, really interesting blueprints for their foreign policy and the alliances. Uh, they both wrote in Foreign Affairs magazine uh, really gave their their views, uh, which I think is is the place for everybody to start, um, and um, uh, you know, and, and to go to go with uh, you know understanding where they're where they're from. I think both are inexperienced from a national security uh, foreign policy perspective, so you're going to have weaknesses in that. Uh, you know, frankly, and you know, I don't like to delve into other countries' politics, uh, but. Uh, I, you know, I think, I think Yoon is, you know, he's saying a lot of the right things that, that would appeal to Americans on the surface. You know, most Americans, uh, Republicans or Democrats, I think, support his views on, you know, being careful on OPCON transition uh, and, uh, um, you know, strengthening the alliance, uh, you know, aligning with the Quad, aligning with the Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, and, you um, uh, and of course, he said that he's going to deploy more THAAD, which shows me his his lack of understanding because he doesn't have the the, the power to deploy more THAAD. You know, he can request it from us, and I, I wonder if we even have enough, given you know the systems we we are placing around the world. Uh, I think we just pulled the ones out of Saudi Arabia that we had there, but uh, um, you know we've been deploying them to different places, and I don't know how how much we have in terms of resources. And of course, the other issue is whoever you and or Lee will they solve the that issue uh, with the local protests uh, that are that are taking place down there? Um, you know, when I when I meet with embassy officials, I remind them that uh, those soldiers that are down there are not living a very good life. You know, with uh, resupply cut, ground resupply limited, having to fly in most everything, and you know, only when they coordinate a big uh, a big resupply effort. So uh, before you you ask for more that we got to better support what we already. have have there so um so those are some issues so I, you know i think you got to read those i think we have to uh, uh we have to be engaged what I, what is interesting though you have the two candidates but then you have people around them uh that uh, are uh you know and on both candidates have people that i think are from uh you know from across the spectrum i mean ambassador we who's uh we sung luck who's who's the national security advisor for 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 lee I mean, I've worked with him a lot over the years, and uh, and you know, I've I didn't think that he was he you know, and I think we we assess that Lee will be following in the footsteps of Moon, and you know, building on Moon's policies. I think in, in general, I think uh, uh, that might be a fair assessment. Although I think he's he's his own man; he's going to do what he what he wants. But uh, I think that um, you know, the people around him. I think those are those are some of the key things, and. You know, and to me, whether it's, and, and I, I think this worked out for Moon as well, but 
you know, it, the people around him, if they have enough influence, uh, they can shape things in, in a positive way. And when you look back over the history, uh, you know, going back from, you know, from Chun Du Wan to No Te Wu to, uh, to Kim Young Sam to, uh, you know, to Kim Dae Jung to No Myo Hoon, uh, to Yi Man Bak to Pak Gune, you know, to, to Moon Jae In, um, we've ended up working things out pretty well. You know, we've had friction, uh, of course, and, and it really doesn't matter our alignment of, you know, conservative American, conservative Korean, you know, liberal Korean, conservative American, vice versa. Um, we tend to make things work. And I think uh, what we should all keep in mind is that uh, the success of, of our national security policy uh, and, um, you know, and U.S. interests in the region are really dependent on our alliances and our two major alliances, uh, the Rock U.S. Alliance and the, the Japanese American Alliance. And I think that, uh, that regardless of who's president, we've got to work to make the alliances work. And I think there'll be enough people within both administrations, whoever wins, that understand that and embrace that. Uh, and, you know, even those who criticize Moon administration and those around him, um, you know, we fared okay. You know, we could have done things better. We could have done things different. Um, you know, I, I just did a, a long interview with the uh, Voice of America on on Moon's administration and assessing his foreign policy, and uh, and I, I've got a lot of feelings on that, um, good and bad, on on what he did, um, and and some of the things that we think are bad, um, you know, pursuing the end of war declaration or or wanting to cut back exercises, and and uh, when we look at that over the time. A lot of that has been testing North Korea, and you know, and those policies that have not worked, uh, that uh, I think is actually a positive outcome because we should be able to say, yeah, that stuff doesn't work, <laughs> and and maybe we can forget about uh, about trying to execute those in the future. Uh, so to me, there's a positive aspect uh, that uh, his his attempts to engage North Korea, you know, continue to improve that uh, prove that Kim Jong Un is the problem, not. South Korea, not the United States. And, uh, and so all the things that have been tried as Steve Began uh, said, when he took over as the, as the, um, as the uh, special representative for North Korea, we were having lunch and he said, uh, he said, you know, what I've learned about Korea is that uh, everything that is, that could be tried with North Korea has been tried <laughs> and none of it works. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, that, you know, he said that half in jest, but I also think there's uh, there is some truth to that, and I think that Moon's policies really, uh, really help to uh, to show us uh, that the problem is Kim Jong Un, not South Korea or the United States. I, uh, I hadn't heard that perspective before. That's uh, that's a very productive one. I believe uh, General Chun uh, has a comment. Yeah, thanks. Um, since we're talking about Korean elections, uh, but before that, uh, as an update. Right now, we have two convoys going into the THAAD battery site each week, and it's going to uh, be extended to three uh, convoys a week, which is which will relieve all of the you know uh, the, the the issues that we've been having so far. So there has been some last minute uh, uh, improvement in the conditions for the troops there. Having said that. I'm a little concerned about some of the um, attitudes that I feel from my friends, uh, my American friends about the selections. And the, and the point is, my friends are telling me, oh, you know, Mbang, uh, no Mian, we had a lot of trouble. Moon, we weren't that happy, but uh, we were able to work things out. In fact, you know, uh, Rock U.S. relations are not bad, and in some cases, pretty good. Uh, joint statements all went well, and uh, and all those things. And uh, Lee Myung Bak, Park Geun they were friends to us. But if you look at very closely, uh, yeah. alliance issues, we had frictions then. Nothing really strengthened the alliance per se. So we can work with anybody. You know, I think this is a very dangerous attitude. And I won't go into specifics because I'm on the record here. But I just want to say uh, people like we 
have said pri privately. Now, we didn't say it, but people like we have said, I joined Lee because there are communists here and I wanted to save this country. Within yeah. Lee's surroundings, there seems to be people who want to get the Americans out of Korea, who believe that's the future of Korea. So, you know, this is, this is uh, quite concerning. Having said that, the conservatives, it's same old, same old. We, we have issues that we need to solve. Within five years, at 10 at the best, North Korea is going to have the ability to strike the United States with nuclear weapons. They have the ability right now to strike where I live right now. They're gonna have that ability within five to 10 years. North Korea of all countries. I mean, this is a storm that's, we need to stop it somehow right now. Uh, one of the things that America really needs to push is a better relationship, I dare to say an alliance with Korea, Japan, and the United States. It's just common sense not just North Korea, but the other neighboring big country that we have that's going to challenge us. And this is even different from Putin. And so how are we going to do that? And you know, I just leave you with that uh, question. Yeah, I think it's really important that uh, the new Indo-Pacific strategy that just was released, you know, the 10 lines of effort, it's the first time the US has ever said that improve rock Japan, you know, trilateral cooperation, you know, is a major part of our, our strategy. And to, to make that a public, uh, uh, you know, a public statement, I think is a very positive thing. And I think, you know, my, my feeling is that, uh, you know, that unless we have a president and a prime minister, president of Korea and prime minister of Japan, who are willing to say, I'm gonna put national security, national prosperity first as the priority and separately manage the historical issues, um, you know, and, and be able to push back on their domestic political constituencies who demand, uh, you know, the demand the friction with the other country. Uh, I think we're not going to prog progress. I think it takes real leadership uh, who are going to stand up to their, their domestic political constituencies, constituencies and say national security, national prosperity are first. You know, we don't want things like using the Jasomia as a, uh, you know, I, when, when South Korea threatens to withdraw from the Jasomi, I, I feel like that's kind of like the statement, you can't fire me, I'll quit first, you know? <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, you know, shooting, you know, biting, you know, biting your nose to, to spite your face there. So um, I, I think uh, I think we need leadership to want to want to solve, not solve, but but effectively manage those those problems. Um, and until we get that, we're going to we're going to suffer in trilateral cooperation. Yeah, right. Which there are many good parts of it, you know. I mean, the, there are many good parts. Uh, the op center in Yakuska, looking at North Korean shipping and, you know, sanctions evasion. Um, you know, I think you know, left to their own devices, the Japanese and ROC militaries, I think, would cooperate very well uh, if uh, you know if you you could separate out the politics. I think we'd have a, a formidable military alliance, trilateral alliance, militarily. Um, and uh, but you know, you can't separate all the politics. But I think the historical issues or something we really need our the leadership of both countries to uh, uh, to try to tamp down. Yeah, Roger, all excellent points. Um, for me personally, it's also been reassuring to see from both the Lee and the Yoon camps, there have been overtures towards uh, trilateral cooperation. So that's been very, very reassuring. At this time, uh, I'd like to open the floor to the members in the room and uh, and uh, Anyone else that's been connected via Zoom, I'd like to remind um, the group, I do have some questions that have been sent to me beforehand, uh, if, uh, if you'd like for me, for me to ask those. I did just receive a question in the chat box um, on behalf of one of the members in the room that is asking on behalf of another member of US Embassy Seoul. Her question uh, that she was relaying from another member is, Mr. Maxwell, do you think that the US should treat potential China to Taiwan hostilities in the same way as it has with Russia to Ukraine? Or is this different entirely? <laughs> wow, that's a great question. Um, 
I guess, I guess yes and no. And um, yes, uh, we, I think we need to learn from the Russia-Ukraine uh, situation and, and learn from that so we can better deal with the, the China-Taiwan situation. However, I, I think that, uh, you know, I think China and Russia come at their, their problems from two different aspects and, and we have to respect those differences. I mean, Ukraine, uh, you know, Russia thinks it belongs to Russia and, and uh, you know, Putin thinks it belongs to Russia. And, and so they, they think they're taking back what's rightfully theirs. And of course, China looks at Taiwan as the, you know, the, the, uh, the rogue province and, uh, and that it, there should be a unified, unified China, um, you know, including Taiwan. I think, I think they're, they will go about things differently uh, in how to achieve that. You know, obviously Putin is using naked aggression. I'm not sure China is, is, is ready to do that. And I don't and you know if it ever will do that. I think the real, the real focus of China is political warfare. Uh, and they are trying to subvert, and have been trying to subvert Taiwan. Uh, and you know, and, and when you look at the politics of Taiwan and, and its political parties, uh, you know, they've clearly over the years have tried to co-opt them uh, to get, you know, to get a political faction developed in Taiwan, you know, that would seek unification. Uh, and uh, um, and I think you know up until uh, Hong Kong, um, you know I think China was pursuing that. I think the miscalculation of how they held, uh, how they dealt with Hong Kong, I think, really put the fear of God into in Taiwan. And so I think that uh, the Taiwanese are are you know are are much more wary of, of Chinese actions. Uh, and you know the, I mean the close contacts between Thai, uh, Taiwan and China. Are, are really amazing. I think, you know, we think of them as two separate, you know, uh, you know, a communist country and a free country, but there's so many, uh, you know, PRC citizens in Taiwan, so many Taiwan, Taiwanese citizens in the PRC, you know, conducting business and, and everything. It's, uh, it's really amazing how much there is. Um, so I, I think that there's, uh, there's differences uh, between the two. Now, in terms of China, Taiwan and US Korea, um, you know, I think this causes a lot of problems in how we look at the, the two problems. And I think one big problem for the United States is uh, that if there do happen to be two conflicts, uh, we are going to be stretched thin. And I know that the guidance in the 53rd SCM in December, you know, that said to plan for new contingencies, um, a lot of people look at that as U.S. forces leaving the peninsula to go fight in Taiwan or demands for South Korean forces to go fight, you know, and uh, particularly naval forces. Um, I think, you know, if there's a, if there does happen to be a conflict in Taiwan, you know, most of the U.S. forces on the Korean Peninsula do not have much utility in uh, in a Taiwan fight. But more importantly, as long as the threat from North Korea exists, uh, we've got to continue to focus on deterrence, uh, both our forces on the peninsula and uh, and, and South Korean forces as well, uh, and and. The contingencies I think we need to prepare for are those U.S. military forces that are dual apportioned, you know, for contingencies in Taiwan and Korea. And we've got to have contingency plans to be able to execute our plans on the peninsula uh, without some of those forces that may be dual apportioned and may not be available. And so uh, I know that General Abrams, you know, sparked a lot of controversy in his interviews uh, in December and uh, his comments about contingency planning and, um, you know, and the, the the, the lack of it during his, uh, his tenure in command. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, we shouldn't be interpreting that as a demand to deploy U.S. and Korean forces from the peninsula uh, to a contingency in Taiwan, as long as the North Korean threat uh, continues to uh, persist. Uh, so, I, and I think we have to, we have to look at contingencies for when we don't have all the forces that we we expect uh, that we're apportioned and that we expect to have. And I think that's really the focus of that guidance. Uh, what I know from unclassified, and I only read, I can only read the statements and, uh, and read the reports since I don't have any insights into uh, the actual workings. Uh, so Taiwan, China is a, is a tough problem. I think there are lessons to be learned. Uh, and one lesson that I think uh, should be learned is, you know, prior preparation is, is best. And I think a mistake we made was not effectively arming and training uh, Ukraine, giving them the assistance they needed. Uh, I think we need to do the same 
and, and we need to do better in Taiwan. Uh, although, again, the situation is much different, you know, geographically, uh, you know, the, the way we'll be fighting in the, in the different domains, air and sea domains, and uh, as well as land domain and cyber domain uh, as well. So, uh, but there are lessons we should be learning. But the most important one, I think, is, you know, developing a deterrent capability within Taiwan that will make, uh, you know, will check the, the uh, PRC thinking uh, and willingness to use force to try to unify. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, again, I think that in the long run, I think the CCP wants, you know, like Sun Tzu says, it's better to take a country intact rather than destroy it. And I think uh, any kind of military conflict will end up damaging Taiwan to make it not, uh, you know, not useful to, uh, to China. So I think that's probably the biggest deterrent uh, to Chinese using major military force against Taiwan. Mm. Yeah, very true. I we have, uh, we have two questions. Uh, I have received a question uh, from Rich Nasir in the chat box, followed by uh, a raised hand from Griff Hoffman. Hey, Mr. Maxwell, uh, thank you for your time. Um, I know that you're a part of the uh, board of uh, directors for the Committee of Human Rights, North Korea. North Korea. And then, so I wanted to ask a question regarding that topic. And so, Many North Korean refugees argue that human rights should be higher on the agenda at the negotiation table, especially between the United States and North Korea. How do you think that human rights can be included in future dialogues with North Korea? That's a great question. Uh, you know, I was hearkening today to hear uh, uh, our Secretary of State talk about human rights in, in Ukraine and Russia uh, and how important they are to the United States. And I think they are. I, I think human rights are a national security issue in addition to a moral imperative. Uh, and in terms of North Korea, you know, I, I don't have to tell this audience how much suffering is is going on inside inside North Korea. Um, but uh, you know, there there are a few things that have to uh, we have to think about. You know, Jung Park, Dr. Jung Park, who is uh, uh, Ambassador Sun Kim's assistant uh, and the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, for East Asia and State, she often asks, "Who is Kim Jong Un more afraid of, <clears throat> the United States or the Korean people living in the North?" And the answer is the Korean people living in the North. And which goes to the, the idea that Kim Jong-un has to deny the human rights of the Korean people in the North in order to stay in power. Uh, and that, that's very, very true. And of course, you know, when you look at the UN Commission of Inquiry, one of the things that is uh, um, criticized is that uh, we're not getting information to the Korean people in the North. You know, they are isolated and, and it's, that's a human rights abuse in and of itself. And so, he is afraid of that. And I think the actions of Kim Yo-jong in, in June of uh, 2020, uh, the, uh, you know, the anti-leaflet law, those are all responses to North Korea's fear about information. And so, and, and, and I would say this as well, when we focus on North Korean nuclear weapons, we legitimize the regime. It, it plays well to the propaganda. We're afraid of North Korea with nuclear weapons. But when we talk about North Korean human rights, it undermines the legitimacy of the regime, and and it it, it uh, you know it really uh, is a, a threat to the regime, and because uh, uh, and, and they are very sensitive to that. You see them you know admit nothing, deny everything, make counter accusations, uh, and even in the UN Commission of Inquiry, you know after that came out, they actually you know passed the the uh, Disabilities Act in North Korea, you know to. You know, admitting they have people that are disabled and, and passed a law. Now, that's all cosmetic and everything, but it indicates there's a sensitivity to that. The last thing I'll say, one of our board members, Ambassador Joseph, uh, was an arms control negotiator in the Reagan administration, and then and again in the Bush II administration as well. And um, he, uh, he said, you know, that um, during the Reagan years, when we were negotiating with the Soviets and start and salt, uh, the... Um, we still focused on human rights and President Reagan did, you know, tear down this wall and, uh, and that we can, we can uh, focus on human rights and uh, focus on arms control or denuclearization. Uh, and, and we should do that. And we should never, never sacrifice our principles. And the last thing I'll say is, I think it's a mistake to make the assumption that if we focus on human rights, that we will never be able to get a, an agreement on denuclearization. Uh, I think we'll never get a an agreement on denuclearization because Kim Jong-un is not going to ever give up his nuclear weapons. You know, as long as he's in power, he's not giving up his nuclear weapons. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a mistake to believe 
that we should put aside human rights so that we can negotiate denuclearization. Uh, I think we have to do both. And that's why we need a human rights upfront approach. And I think the Biden administration wants to do that. <coughs> Although I think that they're, uh, you know, they, they can be criticized for not yet appointing a, uh, a, UN amb or a U.S. ambassador for North Korean human rights. Uh, you know, you guys are waiting. We now have an, uh, a nominated uh, uh, ambassador for South Korea, but uh, we don't have the, the congressionally mandated ambassador for human rights. And, uh, and of course, we haven't had one since Robert King uh, left office in 2017. So, uh, so human rights are important. We should focus on it. Uh, they're a national security issue as well as a moral imperative. Roger that. Uh, now I got a question from Griff Hoffman. Yeah, uh, Colonel Maxwell, thanks so much for your time today. Um, I am currently stationed with the UNC Military Armistice Commission. So my question is a little more UNC focused. Um, and it's, it's rather broad, just looking for your opinion on, with a lot of the topics that have come up recently, end of war declaration. Um, I don't know if you saw, there was an article in the Yonhap last week, um, several high ranking former ROC generals spoke out about attitudes within the Moon administration towards UNC. And working in UNC, um, you get that feel from out of the MMD of, trying to sideline the UNC and unhappy with the UNC's role. So, and also, as you mentioned, the upcoming elections are a huge deal and who gets elected. So I wonder in light of all of that, moving forward the next five years, what's your thought on what UNC's role should be on the peninsula, whether it should remain status quo, armistice enforcement, um, or evolve to something else more focused on DPRK engagement or helping in say, trilateral relationship building between um, South Korea and Japan. So thanks again, uh, Colonel Maxwell. Well, uh, first, I, I think the UN command is really important. Uh, you know, we've long protected it for many reasons. You know, all the reasons, the seven UN bases in Japan uh, and, and the like there. So I, I think the UN command is important. And you know, I think it's primary mission for armistice uh, uh, maintenance is, is, is important. But I also think that um, its most important role, if there is war on the peninsula, is going to be the coalition support to the defense of the rock. And I think that's its, its main, it should be its main focus. It is going to be a force provider of coalition forces to the war fighting command, the rock U.S. Combined Forces Command. And I, but I think we have not done a good job explaining that. And explaining that to the Korean people and and to our counterparts, uh, and so um, you know it, it becomes ever more important as South Korean demographics, you know, the re reduction of military age males, uh, you know, the 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 South Korean army has to be reduced and is reducing in size because of of demographics, uh, which I don't believe will be offset with technology in any significant way. Uh, and so, if there is a real war on the peninsula we're going to need manpower. And, and so the UN command uh, can be that command that does RSOI of, of uh, coalition forces, the sending states, uh, 16 or 20 or however many we have uh, now, and uh, uh, it can RSOI them. And it will be of real benefit to the combined forces command commander, because when he requests forces, uh, it is the UN command that is going to work out the national caveats. And make sure the right force for the right mission will be applied, you know, take on under the tactical control of CFC, you know, for that specific mission, that specific location, for that specific duration. And, and you know, they will work out, the UN command will work out those national caveats, and the UN and the CFC commander won't have to deal with that. That will be a real luxury for a coalition commander uh, to have that uh, on, on its side. Um, I don't think the UN command should get involved in engagement with the North. Uh, I think it, it could be a venue for, for better trilateral cooperation, perhaps, because of, you know, UNC in Korea, UNC rear in, in, in Japan. Uh, I think there are opportunities for that. But what I say most importantly is that the UN command has to engage with the ROC command and the ROC MND, and it has to be transparent in what it's doing. I think over time, you know, as... General Thurman, you know, General uh, 
Sharp, General Scaparati, uh, General Brooks, all the revitalization of the UN command was viewed as some kind of an attempt by the US to create the UNC as a higher headquarters uh, over CFC in preparation for OPCON transition. And, and that's completely wrong. You know, it's not going to be a higher headquarters in a war fighting command. Uh, I think it can have an appropriate role. Uh, and the other thing is that, uh, you know, from a, a, an international political perspective, you know, South Korea will want the world on its side. And you and the UN command provides that method for bringing in forces from, from other countries and to build that coalition uh, against North Korea. And that improves the legitimacy of South Korea, uh, you know, in its defense and in follow on operations uh, that will have to take place in the North. And, but it will be, it has to be a force provider. It has to provide you know, practical support to CFC. But all of that must be understood by our rock allies. And we must be transparent in what we're doing. And, and I would say the rock has to believe that they own the UNC just like, uh, just like uh, they own CFC. You know, now uh, CFC, they do own its co-ownership, uh, but the UNC has to be something that the ROC government and military uh, embrace, uh, you know, because it's there to support freedom in the Republic of Korea. And I would, I would caution you this. I've heard from some of my ROC counterparts uh, words that I, I just pain me, and I'll, I'll be blunt in this. Uh, some Korean officers I've talked to have said, U.S. officers have said that Korea doesn't get a vote on the U.N. command, that it belongs to the U.S., it's administered by the, the U.S. JCS, you know, the executive agent, uh, it belongs to the U.S., and so Korea doesn't get a vote. Well, I will tell you, that is really wrong. Korea has the vote, because Korea could say, U.N. command, pack your bags, you know, and, uh, you know, they are there because Korea allows it, you know, and there's no... UN going to overrule that, the US overruling that. If, if the UN command doesn't, isn't transparent and doesn't embrace its relationship with the ROC government, the ROC MND, uh, you know, I think it could, it could really suffer. So you've got to be transparent and you've got to realize that the UN command is there for really one thing, to support freedom in South Korea, you know, which is its original mandate. And, and the things that it, it brings, again, being able to bring in international forces to support the defense of Korea, support freedom in Korea, is really beneficial to the ROC government, to the ROC people. And, and that's how it needs to be described. Uh, it's, it's not uh, you know, a vestige of, of the Cold War and of the Korean War. Um, yes, we want to keep those UN Security Council resolutions uh, active. Uh, we want to keep it as a placeholder, you know, all those practical things. But really, it's there for Korea. And, and Korea needs to embrace it uh, as supporting its freedom. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I see that hey, we uh, have, I see that hey, we uh, have some additional comments. Uh, I, well, I, we have to you, you gotta let General, You gotta let General Chun talk as, as a former uh, Mac, uh, the, the senior officer to uh, senior rock officer, I'm sure he's okay. got a comment on that. Yeah. More than one. I, I, guys, I usually don't, uh, intercede in these kind of discussions, but I, I just want to say that there is a serious misunderstanding. And in from where I see it, it's a deliberate attempt to undermine the United Nations command uh, to, to eradicate the command from the Korean Peninsula. And I can only conclude that it's for bad reasons. So the message of these people is very, very simple. This is Korea. How come we can't control our own destiny, which is totally absurd. Uh, and they've turned it into a sovereignty issue. And one of the one of the items that they use is Japan. And this was a discussion during the recent campaigning where if we have a contingency on the Korean Peninsula, can we use, can we or should we use Japanese assets? You know, if I have war on Korea, I don't care if it's made in Japan. You know, I don't care if it's made in China, if it will, it'll work and it'll help me survive. But, you know, one, one candidate does not think that uh, no matter what, we should accept uh, Japanese uh, uh, support. 
So they turned the United Nations, they're trying to turn the United Nations command into a sovereignty issue. Uh, and I, again, this is a very serious challenge to undermine the United Nations command. I think that uh, we need to have a really, really strong STRATCOM and education uh, program to teach the public about what the United Nations command is all about. Uh, we also need to teach the Korean officer group that the United Nations command is here for our interest, our being the Korean interest. Right now, we have an impasse uh, about the command between you know, the Moon administration and the United Nations command, which is really sad. So I just want to say that uh, we need to recognize this as a very serious problem. And we need to uh, work very hard to maintain uh, the integrity of the United Nations command on the Korean Peninsula because it is in the best interest of the Korean people. And let me just conclude with a statement about sovereignty. Uh, that is so important, I think. And we as Americans, we need to respect Korean sovereignty. We need to support it. And we need our actions uh, to be such that we demonstrate our support for that. Um, when I was in the Philippines, commanding the Joint Special Operations Task Force, sovereignty of the Republic of the Philippines was in our mission statement. You know, legitimate, you know, maintaining the legitimacy and the sovereignty of the respect for sovereignty of the Philippine government. I think that you know part of our Stratcom should be, we should be addressing sovereignty. You know, we should make sure that the Korean people know we respect Korean sovereignty. We support it. And, and we are, you know, the presence of the UN command, the presence of USFK is there because it is a sovereign decision by Korea to allow them to be there. And I think we, we, we need to approach it that way. Uh, and we are there, of course, to support the freedom and the sovereignty of South Korea. That needs to be part of our STRATCOM. I really, I really think we should be uh, uh, publicly addressing the sovereignty issue. Uh, not from a political perspective, but from an alliance, you know, and uh, uh, shared uh, blood spilling uh, perspective. I'll stop there. Gentlemen, thank you uh, very much for your comments. And thank you for the shout out to Stratcom, even though there might have been an allusion to not, me not having done a good enough job during my last assignment. Um, <laughs> uh, following the official, official uh, conclusion of this discussion, I will leave this meeting open for any follow-on discussion, uh, Mr. Maxwell, if you have additional time. Um, but at this time, Mr. Maxwell, do you have any closing comments uh, for our members joining us today? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. It's always a great, yeah, these are great topics to discuss. Uh, but let me say again to you, the work that you do is really important to our military, to our country, uh, to our alliance. And so uh, I, um, you know, I'm a FAO wannabe. You know, I, I wished I was uh, a FAO. And uh, as you guys do great work, important work, and so keep up that good work because you're making a difference. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to extend our gratitude to you one more time for sharing some of your insight and experience on this March 1st Korean Independence Day in Washington, DC. For those in attendance, please be sure to join as a FAOA member and consider a donation so we can continue to provide unique professional development opportunities such as this one. Follow us on social media and stay tuned to our YouTube channel for this and other conversations that we've had with other distinguished leaders in the field. The opinions expressed today uh, are those of the speakers and do not reflect those of the Foreign Area Officer Association, Department of State, or Department of Defense. Everyone have a great day and thank you for joining us today.